Platform 7 Biology, Energy Flow Ecosystem and the Environment, Topic 5A Photosynthesis. Learning Objectives You should be able to understand the overall reaction of photosynthesis. You should be able to understand how pho photophosphorylation of ADP requires energy and that hydrolysis of ATP provides an immediate supply of energy for biological processes. You should understand the difference between light dependent and light independent reactions. And you should be able to know the structure of chloroplasts in relation to their role in photosynthesis. You should be able to understand what is meant by the terms absorption spectrum and action spectrum. And you should have a certain knowledge about chromatography of the pigments and the techniques used and also about the RF values. And finally, you should be able to know the co-practical 10, which is the investigation of the effects of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis using a suitable aquatic plant. ATP, the energy source of the cell. Energy is essential to life. In the biosphere, there are two types of organisms classified according to how they get their energy autotropic organisms and heterotropic organisms. Autotropes make organic compounds from carbon dioxide by the process of photosynthesis, whereas the heterotropes generally eat plants or other animals which have eaten plants. They use the products of photosynthesis indirectly for making necessary molecules and as fuels to supply energy for their cellular activities. So making chemical bonds need an input of energy. Chemical bonds are constantly being broken in the cellular reactions in living organisms. Energy has to be constantly available in an accessible form ready for use instantly in different reactions. In biological systems, ATP is considered as the universal energy supplier. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's a nucleotide uh, with three phosphate groups attached. Then in, when energy is needed, the third phosphate group can be broken by a hydrolysis reaction. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as ATPase enzyme. So this is the hydrolysis reaction of ATP. As a result of this, ADP or adenosine diphosphate, a free inorganic phosphate group and energy is released. So about nearly 34 kilojoules of energy is released per mole of ATP when hydrolyzed. Some of this energy is lost as heat and is wasted. The rest of the energy is used for any biological activity which requires energy inside a cell. ATP can be synthesized from ADP and a phosphate group with the help of the same ATPase enzyme. And it requires an input of energy which is 34 kilojoule per mole of ATP produced. You can think of ATP and ADP as the charged an uncharged form of a rechargeable battery as shown in this picture. ATP here is the, is the charge form which has very uh, a high amount of energy and that can be used to power cellular reactions. Once the energy has been used the uncharged form of the battery which is like ADP in this instance must be recharged before it can be again used as a power source. Importance of chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are relatively large organelles found in the cells of green parts of the plant. An average green plant cell contains nearly 10 to 50 chloroplasts and they are unequally adapted for the process of photosynthesis. Each chloroplast is surrounded by an outer and an inner membrane with a space between two, which is known as chloroplast envelope. Inside the chloroplast, there is a 
system of membranes that are arranged in layers called grana. A single granum is made up of layers of membrane discs known as thylakoids. This is where the green pigment chlorophyll is found. The pigment molecules are arranged on the membranes in the best possible position for capturing light energy efficiently. The grana are joined together by lamellae which are extensions of thylakoid membranes. These lamellae connect two or more grana. The lamellae act as a skeleton inside the chloroplast maintaining the distance between the grana so that they receive the maximum light and function as efficiently as possible. The membrane layers are surrounded by a matrix called stroma. The stroma contains all the enzymes needed to complete the process of photosynthesis and produce glucose. Glucose can then be used in cellular respiration, converted to starch for storage uses and uh, also can synthesize other organic compounds such as amino acids and lipids. Chlorophyll is the other major adaptation of the chloroplasts. It is a light capturing photosynthetic pigment. Chlorophyll is not a single molecule. It is a mixture of closely related pigments. These chlorophyll includes pigments such as chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, carotenoids, pheophytes. Chlorophyll A is found in all photosynthesizing plants and in the highest quantity of five pigments. The other pigments are found in varying proportions in different plants. These differences give the leaves of the plants their great variety and different greens as shown in this picture. Each of the pigments absorb and captures light from a particular area of the light spectrum. As a result, much more of the energy from the light falling on the plant can be used than if only one pigment was involved. Absorption spectrum. It indicates the wavelengths of light absorbed by each pigment. It is usually represented as a graph. We can find the absorption spectra of different photosynthetic pigments by measuring the absorption of light of different wavelengths. It is also possible to produce an absorption spectrum for whole chloroplasts with all the photosynthetic pigments combined. So this is a graph like that. Action spectra. It indicates the overall rate of photosynthesis at each wavelength of light. So there is a strong correlation between these two cumulative absorption spectra of all pigments and their action spectra. If we superimpose these two graphs, both display two major peaks. A larger peak at the violet blue region which is nearly 450 nanometers wavelength of light and a smaller peak at the red region nearly 670 nanometers of wavelength. Both displays a downfall here in the green region of the visible spectrum which is nearly 550 uh, nanometers. So this demonstrates that having different photosynthetic pigments make a much bigger portion of light available to plants and therefore gives them an adaptive advantage. There are several different pigments in plants. So how can you demonstrate whatever or whether these pigments are exist, exist in plants? 
so it's simply by using a chromatographic technique which is useful in separation and identification of different plant pigments when we place a paper in a container filled with a particular solvent and the tip of the paper touching the solvent the solvent is absorbed by the paper and the solvent moves up the paper by capillary action as the solvent crosses the area containing plant pigment extract the pigments dissolve in and more move with the solvent up the paper these pigments are carried along at different rates because they are not equally soluble in the solvent so here you can see a chromatogram of chlorophyll extracted from a plant showing uh, five photosynthetic pigments once you have contact conducted a chromatography on the photosynthetic pigments you can determine their rf values and compare them to the rf values of known pigments in the same solvent it is important to compare rf values using the same solvent because the pigments can have very different values with different solvents so the rf value uh, is the ratio of the distance traveled by the pigment to the distance traveled uh, by the solvent alone the rf value is always between 0 and 1 and this is an example showing a method for calculating the rf values of two different photosynthetic pigments on a silica gel chromatogram photosystems the photosynthetic pigments absorb light in two distinct chlorophyll complexes known as photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 each system contains a different combination of chlorophyll pigments and therefore absorbs light in a slightly different area of the spectrum uh, wavelength 700 nanometers for photosystem 1 and 680 nanometers for photosystem 2 these photosystems have different functions in photosynthesis you will be able to learn them in the next slides this is a simplified summary diagram for photosynthesis so it is a two stage process involving a complex series of reactions the reactions in the first stage only occur in light the reactions of the second stage occur independently of light the light dependent reactions produce materials to be used in the light independent reactions the whole process occurs all the time during the day, day hours. The light independent reactions can continue when it's dark. Light dependent stage of photosynthesis. The light dependent stage of photosynthesis occurs on the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast and it has two main functions to break up water molecule in a photochemical reaction and to produce ATP which supplies the energy to build carbohydrates so when it comes to light dependent stage of the photosynthesis there are two major types of uh, reactions the first one is cyclic photophosphorylation in the cyclic photophosphorylation it involves only photosystem 1 and drives the production of ATP when light hits the chlorophyll molecule in PS1 a light excited electron leaves uh, the photosystem and it is collected by an electron acceptor and transferred directly along an electron transportation chain to produce ATP when uh, an electron returns to the chlorophyll uh, in PS1 it can then be excited in the same way again and again during non cyclic photophosphorylation water molecules are broken down providing hydrogen ions to reduce NADP ATP is also produced in this process when they have light 
photons constantly hit chlorophyll molecules in both PS1 and PS2. This excites the electrons to a higher energy level. They are therefore lost from the chlorophyll molecule and collected by electron acceptors. An excited electron from PS2 is collected by an electron acceptor and transferred along the electron transportation chain to PS1. Driving synthesis of one molecule of ATP. PS1 receives an electron uh, and to replace uh, the one that was lost in the light independent reactions. Now the chlorophyll molecule in PS2 is missing one electron and so it is unstable. The original electron cannot be returned to the chlorophyll because it has continued on to PS1. So another electron is needed to restore the chlorophyll to its original states. So the electron comes from the breaking down of water molecule, a process which is known as the photolysis reaction because it depends on light. Water molecules disassociate or breaks down spontaneously into uh, H plus or hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. As a result, there are many H plus and OH minus ions in every part of the cell, including the chloroplast. These ions are used to replace the lost electrons from chlorophyll molecule. Once the chlorophyll molecule in PS2 has received an electron, it is restored to its original position, ready to be excited again when hit by another photon of light. At the same time, electrons in PS1 are also being excited by uh, light and collected by an electron acceptor. Electrons are transferred along an electron transportation chain and collects by the electron acceptor which is known as NADP or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. The NADP also collects the hydrogen ion from the disassociated water to form reduced NADP. The reduced NADP and ATP which are produced during non-cyclic photophosphorylation provides source of reducing power and energy respectively in the light independent reactions of the photosynthesis to make glucose. Now we will move on to the light independent stage of the photosynthesis. The light independent stage of photosynthesis uses the reducing power and the ATP produced by light dependent stage to build carbohydrates. This stage consists of series of reactions known as the Kelvin cycle. So this is the Kelvin cycle. The first step of the Kelvin cycle uh, is like this. Carbon dioxide from air combines with 5 carbon compound which is known as ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP in the chloroplast. The carbon dioxide is said to be fixed. So this process is known as carbon fixation. This step need the help of the enzyme known as ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase or oxygenase. Theoretically, the result of this reaction is a, a six carbon compound. Scientists are convinced that this theoretical compound exists but it is highly unstable and it will immediately converted into a 3 carbon uh, glycerate 3 phosphate molecule. So this glycerate 3 phosphate molecule uh, then with the help of reduce NADP and the energy from ATP will convert into another uh, 3 carbon molecule which is known as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Much of the 3-carbon glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate follows a series of steps to replace the RUBP needed in the first step of the cycle. 
However, some of the GALP made is synthesized into 6 carbon uh, glucose sugar or transferred directly into the glycolysis pathway. In this pathway, it may be used for synthesis of other molecules needed by plant. So finally, the reactions of the Kelvin cycle occurs in both light and in the dark. These reactions only stop in the dark when no products of light reaction remain and uh, where there is no reduced NADP or ATP available in the chloroplast. Now we will look what happens to the uh, products of photosynthesis. So GALP is the primary end product of the process of photosynthesis. And uh, some of the GALP is used directly in cellular respiration, whereas some producing the Kelvin cycle is used to uh, produce glucose in a process called glucogenesis. This glucose may be converted into disaccharides such as uh, sucrose and uh, may be into polysaccharides such as starch for storage and also into cellulose for structural support and also GLP can uh, continue and combine with phosphate groups in the soil to produce nucleic acid and also some of the GLP converted into a chemical called acetyl coenzyme A. The acetyl coenzyme A is then used to synthesize fatty acids needed for production of uh, phospholipids for membranes and lipids needed for storage and other functions within the plant. Now we will look on to the limiting factors in photosynthesis. There are three main limiting factors, light, carbon dioxide and temperature. Light intensity affects the amount of chlorophyll which is excited and therefore the amount of reduced NADP and ATP produced in the light dependent stage of the process. If there is a low level of light, insufficient NADP and ATP will be produced to allow the reactions of the light dependent stage to progress at their minimum rates. So light can be therefore uh, expressed as a limiting factor for the process in this situation. Both light intensity and the wavelength of the light falling on a plant will affect the rate of photosynthesis directly. Carbon dioxide concentration is also a very important factor in photosynthesis. If there is not enough carbon dioxide available for fixing in the Kelvin cycle, the reactions of photosynthesis cannot proceed at the maximum rate. Carbon dioxide concentration is therefore considered as a limiter, limiting factor. The other main factor which limits the rate of photosynthesis is temperature. All of the Kelvin cycle reactions and many of the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis are controlled by enzymes and are therefore sensitive to temperature. A plant can only photosynthesize rapidly when the temperature is in the uh, right range or the correct range even if the light and the carbon dioxide levels are abundant. Now we will move on to the co-practical 10 which is the investigation of the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis using a suitable aquatic plant. So as shown in this setup we will need a pond weed plant and it's better if we can take the plant at least a couple of weeks before the practical. So uh, just to acclimatize to the new environment inside the beaker. And most importantly, we should cut the stem of the pondweed plant under the level of the liquid or the water level because it stops an air lock from forming, which stops bubbles from being able to escape. So first place the piece of pondweed approximately uh, 10 centimeters long 
in a large beaker of water and we have to remove the air bubbles gently uh, from using our thumb and uh, we can cover one side of the beaker with aluminium foil so the light can only enter the beaker from the other side and uh, we have to add um, a half a spatula of sodium hydrogen carbonate to the water and leave it for uh, 5 minutes. Sodium hydrogen carbonate solution releases carbon dioxide which is uh, necessary for the photosynthesis pro process. We have to position a bench lamp 10 centimeters from the beaker and we have to allow the pond weed to adjust for the light for at least 5 minutes. And as the next step we have to fill this capillary tubing with water and we can place a, a small funnel um, end of the tubing in the beak of water and we can position the pond weed with the cut end at the top of the funnel opening as shown in this picture. A paper clip can be attached to the opposite end of the pond weed plant um, and it will help to weight it in the correct position inside the beaker. So there is a special assumption that we make in this practical. We assume that the gas produced in this uh, setup is oxygen and the rate of the bubbles form, formed inside the uh, process is directly proportional to the rate of photosynthesis. As bubbles of oxygen begin to form and pass into the capillary tube, we should start uh, the stopwatch. After a suitable time, we can use a syringer to draw any oxygen produced in the capillary tube and we can measure the volume of that particular amount of oxygen and record the volume. So we can do the same steps with the lamp at different distance from the beaker. Or you can repeat the measurements for each distance few times. So when you take the readings, we can uh, plot a graph between the number of bubbles per minute and against the distance of the lamp from the pond weed, like this. So in this practical, independent variable is the distance from the light source or the light intensity, the dependent variable is the number of bubbles produced per minute or the volume of gas produced per minute and the control variables are the concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate solution, temperature and uh, using the same species of the pond weed for each experiment. According to the graph in this slide, you can see if we double the uh, distance, the number of bubbles per minute uh, will fall by a factor of 4. So going from a distance uh, of 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters causes the number of bubbles to fall by 4 times. And going from 40, tw uh, sorry, 20 centimeters to 40 centimeters the number of bubbles per minute again falls by four times. So scientists call this uh, situation the inverse square law because if we double the distance the light intensity falls by four times and because we need light for photosynthesis that also causes the number of oxygen bubbles to fall by four times. So it is clear that the light intensity is inversely proportional to the square root of the distance. So if, if we can plot a graph between uh, 1 over d squared and the number of uh, oxygen bubbles per minute, you can get a straight graph like this. Okay, now we'll move on to the questions. The first question. 
Photosynthesis involves light dependent and light independent reactions. The diagram below shows some of the stages in the light dependent reaction of photosynthesis. A part. Put a cross in the box next to the row in the table that correctly identifies the products P, Q and R made from one molecule of water. So what are the processes? So it's very clear the answer is uh, the products are uh, the, for P it's uh, electrons. Q is hydrogen ions and R is oxygen atoms. Question B part. Put a cross in the box next to the name of the reaction K. So what is reaction K here? Water will give oxygen atoms. So what is the reaction? It is the photolysis reaction of water. So hope you will do the other questions given in this slide and as try to do the exam practice questions which are on page number 20 and 21 in your textbook. As we have come to an end of this lesson, we will summarize the topics that we uh, discussed. We discussed about the process of photophosphorylation of ATP and we discussed the structures of chloroplasts in relation to their role in photosynthesis process. We did discuss uh, the difference between the absorption spectrum and the action spectrum and we discussed how uh, chromatographic methods can be used to differentiate uh, pigments in chloroplasts and how to get an RF value and we discuss the light dependent reactions as well as the light independent reactions of the photosynthesis and we discuss um, the fate of the products of photosynthesis and the limiting factors necessary for photosynthesis as well as the co-practical 10 and these are the references that you can go through. Hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you.